He's like, it's like this, Solis. It's like God is baking perfect cookie for you that will be presented at the perfect place at the perfect time under the perfect circumstances. And in the meantime, it's your responsibility to practice patience and these 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And when your time comes, you'll know it. Well, hello, friends of Bill W. and other friends. You have landed on Sober Speak. My name is John M. I am an alcoholic, and we are glad you are all here, especially newcomers. Newcomers, that is, both to recovery as a whole and newcomers to this podcast. Sober Speak is a podcast about recovery centered around the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. My job here on Sober Speak is simple. My job is to provide a platform to the amazing stories of recovery all around us. Consider Sober Speak, if you will, your meeting between meetings. Please remember, we do not speak for AA or any 12 step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride. Take what you want and leave the rest at the curb for the trash man to pick up. Greetings from Studio AA, deep in the heart of Texas. That was the voice of Mr. Solus R that you heard at the beginning of this here episode. And you are going to hear so much more from Solus in just a moment, but first things first, this here episode is made possible by Audrey, Mary Lynn, Laura, and Tim. And so you ask yourself, you you ponder, you you, you deliberate, you, you mull over the question of what exactly did Audrey Mary Lynn, Laura, and Tim do? Well, let me tell you what they did. They visited our humble, oh, very humble little website, www.soberspeak.com. They clicked on the donation tab and they made a contribution. So thank you so much, Audrey, Mary Lynn, Laura, and Tim. This episode is coming right out to Ewan's. I, John M., just another bozo on the bus, will indeed be the chairperson for this meeting between meetings, and I am truly honored. You can't see it right now, but I'm holding my hand over my heart, and I'm bending over, and I'm bowing. Uh, I am truly honored and privileged to serve all of you listening in, so take a seat around this here, virtual table, wherever you are, and let's get started. Now, remember, no matter where you are or what your past looks like, you're welcome here. It's an open table for all, and we're glad that you have joined us. All right, so you are going to be listening today to Mr. Solus R. Uh, Solus is from the great, and I mean the great city of Austin, Texas. We recorded this one live, coming out to you live. I don't know for those of you who are uh, football fans and Brent Musburger used to, whenever they would hover the blimp or whatever sort of uh, device they had hovering over the 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 stadiums and they would have that shot coming down on the stadium and he would say you are looking live at whatever stadium it was but anyway um so we record <laughs> we're getting back on track here we recorded this live at the tri cities uh, event here in North Texas, and we are calling this here episode the perfect cookie. Solus has been sober since December 13th, excuse me, not December 13th, I'm getting a little dyslexia there, December 
first of 1987, and that's a long time. So, folks, let me give you a little bit of a glimpse of what's going on behind the curtain here. You are going to hear Solus discussing uh, a PowerPoint presentation that he has and making clicking sounds like he is moving from one slide to another. However... Never fear, you are not missing out on anything. There are no slides, and Solus has a clicker sort of device in his hand making some sort of noise. So when you hear that, like I said, you're not missing out on any pictures. It's just uh, him (laughs) pointing to a a blank television screen, basically. Anyway, Solus talks about his time in the Navy and the, quote, crime he was arrested for his battle with depression and what not to do to help with depression, Uh, how his sponsor told him God is not a pimp. (laughs) He talks about step 0.05 in Alcoholics Anonymous and what that is to him. Uh, He discusses a sane sex ideal, as discussed in the big book, Uh, dating in sobriety, having fun in sobriety, his relationship with his mother and father, and much, much more. And folks, I am going to put off uh, some of the listener feedback this week and present what I have next week. Uh, It's a long story. You don't want to hear any of that. But just know, for those of you tuning in, there will be no listener feedback at the end of this here episode. So enjoy, and I know you will, Mr. Solis. And if you have any, by the way, it's S-O-L-I-S, just in case you didn't see it in the title of it. Uh, It's a very cool name, but uh, uh, nothing like, you know, mine, a Plano John. On J O H N M. But anyway, if you need to contact me, feel free to reach out. I'm a John J O H N, like I just spelled, or no, like I just said, not, or did I spell it? I can't even remember. J O H N as soberspeak.com. Uh, we would love to hear from you, and uh, I think that's going to do it. Enjoy Sordis. Thank you very much for tuning in today. My name is Solis, and I'm an alcoholic. Just another alcoholic. I am uh, so glad to be here. I'm um, from Austin, Texas. My home group is the Lambda Live and Let Live group, Sunday morning, 11 a.m. at the Galano Club. Um, If you're ever in Austin, please, please come see us. We'd be happy to uh, show you some hospitality and return to what you've given me tonight. Um, I see some friendly faces in the audience, some folks from Austin. Thank you so much for coming all this distance. That just means the world to me. I even see a few sponsees here. You can give them uh, your condolences after the meeting. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. And for those of you who have not heard me uh, speak before, I have a very unorthodox way of telling my story. Um, I use slides, and so we're going to project slides. Um, and uh, I don't have a, a screen screen, so I'm just going to use this television up here. And I'm going to uh, go ahead and project the images right up here on this television. Hmm. There we go. So we're going to start off with the first slide. The Capitol Dome of Sacramento, California. That's where I was born and raised. Good place to be from. Happy to be away from there. But for all intents and purposes, good place to be from. That's my family. You can see in height order, I'm the oldest of five kids in a Mexican-American Catholic family. The woman that's on the end there with the glass in her hand, that's my mother, the alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic because I come from an alcoholic home. It's really important for me to point that out. I'm an alcoholic because I like the effect produced by alcohol. When it enters my body, um, there's a warmth that comes over me and through me, and instantly my favorite three words are yours, free, and more. And I have no way of controlling that response. It's just what happens to me. And so uh, that's me in high school. And uh, that's when I had my first drink. I was 16 years old. Um, I'll tell you, I was not a popular kid in school. Um, uh, I was the one that people put into lockers and stuffed into trash cans. And I was just not, yeah. Um, not popular. Um, and so, uh, I mean, it was the eighties. And if you were, if you were being kind, you would say that I had characteristics that were effeminate, but nobody's ever kind in high school. Right. 
so they had a lot of other names for me. Right. And, um, so, uh, so cap, uh, captain of the wrestling team, Brian came through my little line at the grocery store I worked at and he said, Hey, we're having a party on Saturday night. You should come. And I was like, no, thanks. <laughs> Cause you know, I'd seen that movie Carrie and I was pretty sure there was a bucket of blood with my name on it. So I was like, uh, no, thank you. And, uh, he came through the line a few more times and, and I was like, okay, I'll go to this party. And I was terrified. It's absolutely terrified. But here were all the popular kids, like the high school football team and the cheerleaders and all the popular kids. And uh, somebody passed me a drink and said, here, drink this. And so I downed it. Mm. I can still feel the burn. It went down. I coughed. I gagged. Uh, snot ran from my nose. Tears ran from my eyes. I had just drank a huge gulp of Bacardi 151, which became a drink. And so, but an amazing thing happened that night. Amazing. I was talking to people and they were talking back. I was laughing with people and they were laughing back. This had never happened to me before. Like how it magically transformed that I was having a good time with people I was terrified of was miraculous. I just knew I wanted this feeling all the time, all the time, right? And so, I graduated from high school. This picture here is a bar in Sacramento called The Rec Room. It's kind of a falling down looking place. Uh, sawdust and peanut shells on the floor. You know, got dark and scary. One of those bars that you need a drink to go in and have a drink because it's so scary. And um, I loved that place. It smelled like urine. And it was dark and dank. And um, But what I loved about that place was the reception right? Because remember in high school, I didn't get a very good reception. So now I'm out of high school and I walk in and when I walk into the bar, people are like, woo, Solis is here. The party has begun. And I'd be like, yes, it has. And I'd go there seven nights a week to get that reception. So here's the truth. Alcoholism is a progressive disease. Progressively, my reception got less enthusiastic. Right. So it went from, woo, so Lisa's here, the party's begun, to here he comes. Here he comes. Hang on to your drinks, your drugs, your wallets, and your husbands, because here he comes, right? And I did use the D word, and it'll be the only time I use it tonight, even on 420. And the reason that is, is because we have singleness of purpose in Alcoholics Anonymous, right? And that's really important. I didn't understand that when I first got here. And and uh, what I can share with you is uh, if we have someone over here talking about drinking and another person over here talking about snorting and another person over here talking about shooting, the person who came into AA looking to stop drinking or getting DUIs or whatever it is they came in for may not relate, use that as an excuse to leave and not come back. So we do one thing and we do it well and we talk about alcoholism. But when I'm talking about it up here, I want you to know that I'm talking about all of it because I use a lot of alcohol in many different forms, right? So I don't care for you if it came in a pill, a powder, a syringe, a leaf, whatever. A drink is a drink is a drink. So I love me some alcohol and I love me some lumpy alcohol. And so um, I like the lumpy alcohol because it balanced against the liquid alcohol and it I could drink a lot more without going into a blackout. And um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. So back, back to the rec room. So that's me walking out of the rec room because I realized I have a problem. I have a serious problem. Back to the Capitol Dome. Sacramento is the problem. If I could get my drink on and my lumpy drink on somewhere else, I might get a better reception back to the good old days like I used to get, because clearly I had wore my reception out, right? So I did what seemed perfectly natural to me because I didn't have a job, I didn't have any money, I didn't have education, and so that's me in a Navy outfit. I joined the United States Navy. I know. Solve one problem, create a string more. Uh, because I still hadn't worked out this uh, effeminate characteristic thing and um, wasn't really compatible with the Navy. And I still haven't worked it out, by the way. And so um, so it posed a challenge, right? And so uh, another challenge that I had in the Navy is, you know, when I was 
drinking in Sacramento, I would be late to work all the time and I'd eventually lose my job or just quit. And that didn't stop when I got into the Navy. It actually got worse, right? And what I learned in the Navy is they will not hold a ship or a plane for you if you're late. <laughs> they just leave, right? They call it missing ships movement. It's a crime. Then you have to go see the captain and you have to explain yourself. And uh, so I had gone to explain myself one too many times, right? And they said, you're going to level one rehab. And I'm sitting in level one rehab, which is like outpatient, you know, and I'm thinking, how is this supposed to help me with my tardiness problem, right? Like, and the alcohol counselor is like, why do you think you're here? And why do you think you're here? Why do you think you're here? He gets around to me. He's like, why do you think you're here? I'm like, I'm here because I got back problems. Namely, everyone's on it. If they get off of it, I would be just fine, right? I did not think I was an alcoholic. When I compared my drinking to all my shipmates, oh my God, they all drank as bad or worse than I did. So I just could not see how this was supposed to help me. In fact, what I had done, because I'm a deluded alcoholic, right, as I created a scenario in my mind where I was like, okay, the Navy probably thinks I'm too fabulous for the Navy, and rather than throwing me out for that, they're going to blame it on this alcohol thing, right? So that's really what's going on here. So I was late yet one more time, and um, this time... My chief petty officer standing in the parking lot waiting for me. So he says, why are you late today? I had a different excuse every day. Every day was a different excuse. So this time I was like, um, because I had a blowout on the way to work. And I was thinking, God, what a great lie, Solis. Oh my gosh, could you lie any better? That was awesome. Because I had slept in my uniform the day before and I was all wrinkled and disheveled and dirty. You know, I looked like I just changed the tire, right? And he was like, wow, okay, open up your trunk. I want to see your blown tire. And like my heart fell into my stomach, right? We open up the trunk and there is a blown tire. Cause I had a blowout like a year before and never got it fixed. <laughs> I know my sponsor, when I got sober, tried to talk to me about procrastination. I was like, no, it does sometimes work. <laughs> so it worked for me that night. I ended up going to level two rehab, which wasn't so much fun. I was confined to base and I had to go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I walked in and I saw, well, the 12 steps on the wall, right? I jumped right to the G word and was like, oh no, how can the federal government order me to come to a religion? Do we not have separation of church and state? And I already got my first resentment. And then I started looking through them and going, okay, I'll do that one. Don't need that one. Don't got no amends to make. You know, I'd already set myself up for problems in Alcoholics Anonymous because I decided what I was going to do and what I wasn't going to do. And as a result, I suffered because that's what happens when you drink, you don't have a solution, and you run into these things called consequences. You suffer, right? So um, it was around this time that I got arrested and charged with homosexuality because it was a char it was a crime up until about 10 years ago. And uh and I just remember thinking, you know, um that I didn't want any part of this life anymore. And uh and I'd had suicidal thoughts uh before um in drinking um, and, and I remember being in the counselor's office, the alcohol counselor's office, and he was like, you don't think you're an alcoholic? I was like, no, I don't think I'm an alcoholic. He's like, what do you think your problem is? I was like, I think maybe I'm depressed. He's like, oh, okay. He goes, so your solution for your depression is pouring mass quantities of depressant into your body. <laughs> I was like, when we say it like that, it sounds insane, right? But that's what we do, right? We find ways of medicating ourselves so that we don't have to deal with this thing called life. And as a result, I can't cope and I can't solve my own problems. And I can't, uh, with sufficient memory, remember the pain and suffering of a few weeks or a few months ago, right? That's what the book says. Mine lasts seven hours because that day in the parking lot, the chief said, okay, this time you're off the hook because he saw the blown tire. He was like, but no more. You're late one more time. We're sending you to see the captain. And I don't care if he takes a stripe or throws you out because I am not covering for you anymore, right? 
And that night when I was coming home from the bar, a bar called Tiffany's in Detroit, which you might look at and say, isn't that the rec room? Yeah, it could have been the same bar, right? Peanut shells on the floor. You're in, I mean, I just find them everywhere I go. So I'm living in Detroit. I'm driving home in snowy conditions and driving too fast for the conditions. And my car goes into a skid, right? As I'm push the button on the garage door. The garage door is going up. My car starts to slide into the driveway. I close my eyes. I hold the, t- the wheel as tight as I can. And when I come to, when I open my eyes, there's my car in the garage perfectly sideways. I slid into the garage perfectly sideways, right? And I'm one of those alcoholics that can't deal with it now, right? I'm like, oh God, I'll deal with this tomorrow. I can't deal with this right now. Right. I come out in the morning and there's my car sideways in the garage. And I'm thinking, this is a great excuse. Like nobody's ever used this one before, right? <laughs> I call the chief petty officer. I was like, I, I, my car's in the garage sideways. And he's like, I'm going to come over and see this, right? He's like, yeah, we're sending you to level three rehab. So after I made it through the legal process for um, homosexuality. I I didn't get kicked out, but they gave me a card and they said, you're going to have to get this card signed off at 12 step meetings, probably for the rest of your career. And I was like, 12 step meetings, any 12 step meetings. They were like any 12 step meeting. I was like, fine, great. So, you know, what I did is I marched myself across the hall from the AA meeting to the uh, sister fellowship for people who can no longer control and enjoy their alcoholic, because I showed you in that, first picture that my mother was an alcoholic. So I thought I qualify for that other program. I'm gonna go hang out over there. And um, what happened was I started to put time in that other program, right? And inevitably, they asked me to speak at a conference, an AA conference with Al-Anon participation, right? Toronto Gratitude 1987. So I've been asked to speak in Toronto at this big conference, and I've never spoken at a conference before. I mean, I'm kind of nervous. Like, what? I mean, amongst amongst all these strangers. (coughs) So I did what seemed perfectly natural to me. I stopped at the hotel bar on the way to the podium. I got myself a beverage. And they sat me up on the stage next to the AA speaker. Because I'm supposed to tell my story, and then she's going to get up and tell her story. So she leans over, and she goes, oh, (laughs) honey, is that tequila? (laughs) So, you know, I leaned back, and I was like, oh, honey, is that jealousy? (laughs) (laughs) But I want you to know how God works in my life, right? Okay, I'm in Toronto, Canada. There's Detroit, and the speaker that night is named Grady O'Hare. She's from Sacramento, California, my hometown, right? So I get finished telling my story, and I sit back down, and she goes, you said in your story that you're coming back to California. I said, yeah, I just got orders. I re-enlisted for four more years. So she said, oh. She goes, well, when you come back to Sacramento, come down to the North Hall Group of Alcoholics Anonymous, because we are saving a seat just for you. I was like, I know what that meant. But I'll fast forward to my last drink, December 31st, 1987. And I come to out of a blackout, which is common. That's not uncommon at all. But this time, I'm in the back of a a police car with handcuffs on. This is new. (laughs) I've not not done this before. And, um, you know, when you have to lean over and ask the police why you're being arrested, that's a sign you might be an alcoholic, right? And so um, I just remember being reduced to two thoughts, just two. These handcuffs are tight, and this crap has got to stop. Stop the ride. I want off, right? I was tired of being hit by consequences so hard that I couldn't get back up off the floor anymore. So January 1st, 1988, I walked into the North Hall Group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Sacramento, California. Yeah. And here's the thing, again, how God works. It was a beginner's meeting, right? Right. With a a panel of old timers and an ask a basket format. So you write out any question you ever wanted to know about Alcoholics Anonymous. And then they got old timers up there who unfold your paper and read it out loud. 
and I'm hiding in the back and they were like, is there anybody, you know, any new? And I was like, my name's Sulis, I'm going to call. And they're like, who, who said that? And I was like, my name's Sulis, I'm going to call. Because Grady O'Hare is sitting up there in the panel, right? <laughs> I don't want to see her. And she goes, you, <laughs> we have been waiting for you. She goes, shut the F up. You told us everything you know when you announced yourself as an alcoholic. You don't need to say anymore. Just listen. And I remember thinking, we never talk to newcomers in Ellen on that way. And what finishing school did she flunk out of? Because I deserve better treatment than that, you know? But the truth was, in 1988, there was not a treatment center on every corner. And even if you found a treatment center, you better have cash because they didn't take insurance. Insurance did not cover treatment back then, right? So AA was quite literally the last house on the block. There was no other alternative, right? So when they asked me to scrub the toilets and they asked me to wash the ashtrays, right? I did those things because I had to demonstrate my gratitude for Alcoholics Anonymous. It's harder today <laughs> to ask people to do those things because their introduction is through treatment rather than through AA. But those people really, really, oh my God, they tolerated me so hard, y'all. I was not happy to be in Alcoholics Anonymous, right? I, I just was not happy, you know? And I made it really hard on my sponsor, you know? Um, that's me at a mobile phone in 1988. Now, this was before cell phones, so it's a glass box that they had on every other corner, right? And I got a roll of quarters in my pocket because I got to call him every day, right? So um, that's me with a disgusted look on my face because he's just hung up on me. He does that a lot. Now I got to drop another 50 cents in because our conversations went like this. I call him and say, hey, I'm checking in like I'm supposed to check in. He's like, how you doing? I'm like, okay. He's like, just okay? I'm like, just okay. He's like, well, have you been to a meeting yet today? No, not yet. Well, you might want to do that. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Click. 50 cents. Did you hang up on me? He's like, yeah, because you don't know. Because you know. Call me when you don't know. Click. Dollar fifty. Stop hanging up on me. He's like, stop knowing. I'm like, it's just a saying. It's just a phrase. He's like, yeah, I believe you believe that. He goes, but probably in your subconscious, you really think you have the answer. And here's the truth. Why would you seek a solution if you believe you already have the answer? How can you claim to have an open mind if you've already drawn the conclusion, right? So we're going to eradicate certain words from your vocabulary. We're going to take out words like, I know. We're going to take out words like always. We're going to take out words like never, right? Because these are words that are finite. They indicate that you've already made a decision, that you've already come to a conclusion. And unless you're open-minded and willing, this is not going to work. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. Click. Damn it. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying, but I believe I'm starting to understand. He's like, great. Okay. Let's work with that. Right. And, um, you know, and I told him up front, I mean, I'm in, you know, my first 30 days and I just told him up front, you know, I'm pretty sure I have problems that are way more severe than alcoholism. And he's like, really like what? I was like, terminal loneliness. Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure I need a relationship. If I had a relationship, man, I bet I could go places, do things, right? And he's like, wow, you got the 30 day chip yet? I'm like, almost don't hate. He's like, it's like this, Solis. It's like God is baking perfect cookie for you that will be presented at the perfect place at the perfect time under the perfect circumstances. And in the meantime, it's your responsibility to practice patience and these 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And when your time comes, you'll know it. And I was like, <laughs> really? Is this like in the book somewhere? Because I've never seen it. And he's like, yes, just keep coming back, right? So I'm watching time go by. I'm doing the things they've asked me to do. Right. I'm sweeping the floors. I'm washing ashtrays. And, you know, um, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, six months, nine months. I get my one year chip and I walk up to him and I was like, where the hell is my cookie? And he said, well, it's like this, Solis. <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous is not like cash and prizes. Right. And uh, and God's not a pimp. You know, 
He's not going to produce a man just because you want one. This ain't Domino's Pizza. He ain't going to be delivering in 20 minutes or less, right? Um, and I'm just like, ah. And he opens up the book, the 12 and 12, to the fourth step. And then there it says, we have an inability to form a true partnership with another human being. Ooh, that's harsh. Do you realize how harsh that is? Like, we have an inability to form a true partnership with another human being. I just remember thinking, God, that's harsh, right? And he said, yeah. He said, because in order to experience love, you'd have to put somebody else's needs before your own on occasion. You can't do that, right? So you're not a good candidate for a relationship. And I was just like, ah. It wasn't long after this that I had a blow up at the meeting because I was not happy about being sober. I was not happy about being an Alcoholics Anonymous and I was not happy that my cookie hadn't arrived. And so um, my homegirl was the men and women together meeting in San Jose, which is a really big meeting. And they had a microphone like this and they call on you and you have to walk up to the microphone and share. So they called on me and I walk up there and I was like, my name is Solis, this is my last meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And they all started laughing. I was like, no, seriously, like I'm leaving. But before, I mean, I, I'm just leaving. And they're just laughing. And I was like, getting matter, matter. And I was like, no, I'm serious. Like, I don't want to be one of those people that you all talk about Denny's afterwards. Like, whatever happened to Solis? I am telling you up front, I'm leaving. And they're just laughing. And I was just like, okay, here we go. So I started and calling people out, naming names. I was like, you talk about service. I've never seen you pick up a coffee cup. You talk about greeting the newcomers. You're talking about the cute ones. I've never seen you shake the hand of an ugly one. And I just keep going down the road. And I get down to poor Doug H and I ran out of things to say. So I just said, dude, your hair is so perfect. You carry the message of good grooming. I think you're all a bunch of effing sheep. I think if this old timer over here walked off the cliff, the rest of you would just follow blindly and I'm not following. And so I went and sat down. Um, if you've ever had the experience of going to meetings in the Bay Area of California, when someone finishes sharing, they clap. And that night they cheered. The bad sister section in the back row gave me a standing ovation. And I started crying. I started crying because I had hit you with both barrels. I'd unloaded the last of my ammunition. Right. What I wanted that night was for you all to say, wow, you are way too sick for us. You're right. Because that would have given me the permission I needed to go out and do what I wanted to do. But instead, wouldn't you know it? There was a long line of people to give me a hug after that meeting. My sponsor was in that line and he was like, ooh, <laughs> OK, so we're all a bunch of effing sheep, huh? He's like, keep coming back. He said, yeah, I'm going to help you with your own analogy. If we're a group of sheep and the wolf is represented by alcohol, which one's he going to pick off? The one who's trying to get away from the flock, and that has been you for the last 18 months. Why don't you put your butt in the center of Alcoholics Anonymous where the wolf can't get you? And behind him was Roger with 50 years of sobriety, and I don't like Roger. Um, I didn't like Roger because my service commitment was sweeping the floors after the meeting. And I liked that service commitment because everybody went to the meeting after the meeting and they'd say, we're going to coffee to Denny's afterwards. I'd be like, sorry, I have to sweep the floor because <laughs> I didn't want to go. I didn't want to talk to people. I didn't want them talking to me. And I could be left alone to sweep the floor, except Roger was always sitting in his chair, reading his big book. And I'd have to ask him to lift his feet so I could sweep underneath him. And he'd say, hey, kid. Do you want to know the secret to staying sober and Alcoholics Anonymous? And I'd be like, yeah, Roger, what's the secret to staying sober and Alcoholics Anonymous? He's like, mm, you're not ready. But the night he was behind my sponsor in that line, he said, hey, kid, do you want to know the secret to staying sober and Alcoholics Anonymous? I was like, yeah, Roger, what's the secret to staying sober and Alcoholics Anonymous? He said, good, I'm glad you asked because I think you're ready. The secret to staying sober and Alcoholics Anonymous is simply this. Let us help you. That's it. Let us help you. Cease fighting everything and everyone. Stop walking in here with an attitude. Nobody's interested. Nobody cares. We're trying to save your life, right? And if you let us, we'll do it, right? And that had, that was there was no truer statement. You know, I had struggled going in and out, in and out, in and out. 
and he would say things to me like, he'd say, what, what's wrong? And I'd be like, I'm having a hard time with God. And he'd say, yeah, that figures. Because it's never occurred to you how many times God has had a hard time with you. And I would be like, there he goes again, talking in riddles and bumper stickers, you know, and and I, you know, came in yet again, got another desire chip. It got to the point every time Monday rolled around and they say, does anyone want a desire chip? The whole group would kind of look at me because they knew I was going to get one. So he'd be like, what happened this time? I'm like, I don't know. I just went out. He was like, well, see, that's the problem. You're a liar. Because if you say you went out, that implies you were ever in. And so you've been around Alcoholics Anonymous, but in order to be in Alcoholics Anonymous, you actually have to do the things we do. And you haven't really committed to doing that. Whatever. One time he said, okay, this in and out thing is not working for us. You're going back to step point five. I was like, what the heck is step point five? He goes, you know what step point five is. He's like, no, I don't know what step point five is. He goes, we read at the beginning of every meeting. Every meeting, we read it. And I was like, I don't, I don't know what the step point five is. He's like, ah. <sighs> okay. If you want what we have and you're willing to go to any link to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps. We've never answered the if in the end. We can't go on to the steps until we've answered the if in the end. Do you want what we have? What do you have? We have a way of living that works. Do you want that? I was like, yeah, I do want that. He's like, and are you willing to go to any links to get it? Now, when you say any links, he's like, stop. If you have to ask, you're not ready. Right? And when I finally had my blow up and I was ready, I was willing to concede to my innermost self that I was an alcoholic and that I was not going to be able to do this unless I was willing, open-minded to receiving the help that was offered here. And that's when things changed for me. Um, in fact, it wasn't long after that that the cookie rolled into the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. My sponsor around that time said, because I was complaining yet again about where is this cookie? And he said, um, well, it sounds like you're ready for a sane, sound sex ideal. So get your big book, bring your, uh, your journal over here, and uh, let's do some work. So he said, okay. What I need for you to do is take this piece of paper and write out everything you ever wanted in a man. I'm like, I'm going to need two pieces of paper. He's like, great. The more thorough, the better, right? So I write out my list and I give it to him and he starts laughing and crossing things off. And I'm like, you said that was my list. I could put anything I wanted on that list. That's exactly what you said. He goes, I did say that. Let's look at some of these things, right? He's like, here's a good one. You'd like him to be over six feet tall. I was like, well, yeah, is there something wrong with that? He's like, are you over six feet tall? I was like, well, no. He said, asking something in exchange for nothing is the very definition of selfishness. We're going to go through this list and we are going to cross off every selfish thing, everything that you cannot deliver in return. Oh, here's a good one. You'd like them to be uh, faithful and monogamous. He's like, have you ever been faithful and monogamous in any relationship you've ever been in? And I was like, well, no. Not technically. And he's like, you, so you don't really know anything about it then, do you? We're going to cross that off too. I'm like, I could be blonde. He's like, from a bottle. We're crossing that off. And when we got finished, we were left with boring things like kind, et cetera. You know. But he said, now you have your list. He goes, see, you've been off shooting Cupid's arrow, whatever it is you're shooting. You don't even have a target. Now you have a target. He wrote little check boxes next to every single thing that was left on the list that he hadn't scratched out. And he said, you have your shopping list. You are now ready to date. So when the cookie rolled in, because he said, you're going to ask somebody out in AA, I was like, <laughs> no, 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 that's not happening. No, 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 because he's like, it's a big scratch and dent sale in here. Like, um, whoo. I am not interested. No, this would be like shopping in the irregular section and it's not happened, right? And he said, or you might find someone who is on a parallel spiritual path, right? And he's like, so uh, here's the deal. He's like, you're jumping up and down in front of this oven going, hurry, hurry, hurry. And it hasn't even occurred to you that it might be getting hot in here. Maybe you're on the inside of that oven looking out rather than outside looking in. Maybe you're somebody's cookie who's not yet ready to be presented at the perfect place at the perfect time under the perfect circumstances. 
And I was just like, wow. Like, I never thought about that. And he's like, yeah, nowhere in the literature does it say happily ever after or holy matrimony. Nowhere, right? What we will promise you is this, that you will live a useful and purposeful life. And God will see to it that you do that. And it doesn't require a hymn to do that. You can do that on your own, right? So we will see to it that, you know, that cookie does roll up at the perfect time under the perfect circumstances or that you're okay without it. So I was like, okay, fine. I'll ask somebody out in the program. So when the cookie rolled in, I was like, okay, that guy over there. And he's like, okay, great. Go over there and ask him. I was like, oh man, I don't want to do this. So I came back and he's like, did you do it? And I was like, no, I didn't do it. He's like, why not? I was like, God, I just don't know if I'm ready for sex yet. And he's like, sex? Who said anything about, I said dating. Do you not know what dating is? I was like, I think so. He's like, no, I don't think you do. He's like, dating is merely gathering information. That's it. You ask somebody out to coffee or you ask somebody out to lunch. You spend no more than one hour asking them questions, right? They get to these boxes that you have on this piece of paper, right? At the end of one hour, you're done. Yeah, you might be having a really great time and a really great conversation and you want it to go longer than an hour, but you have taken up enough of their time. Don't be selfish. Excuse yourself. Thank them for their time. In your morning meditation, ask God, did I gather enough information? You're only going to get one or two answers. Either I gathered more information than I ever wanted or needed, (laughs) or I'd like more information. So he's like, either way, you pick up the phone, you call the person and you say, I really enjoyed coffee yesterday. I feel like I've made a new friend in AA. I'll see you in a meeting sometime. Bye. Right? You've left no wonderment about what it was, where it's going, what it is. Or in the other scenario, you call and you say, hey, I really had a great time at coffee yesterday. Do you think you might be free in a couple of weeks to do that again? I'm like, a couple of weeks? He's like, yeah, you want more information and you want it now, preferably horizontally, but that's not how this is going to go. Right? And if this is a lifelong errand, what is two weeks? Mm-hmm. When you put it that way, right? What is two weeks? So about, gosh, it must have been about nine years ago. That's me standing in a courtroom in New York City. And for a change, I'm not being called the defendant. Um, I'm being asked by the judge, do you take this cookie to be your lawfully wedded husband? And so, um, yeah, um, that guy is sitting in the front row, and we've been together for 34, coming up on 35 years. Oh, my God. And you can absolutely clap, because I'm telling you up front, gay relationships are like dog years. That's a long time. I mean, that's a long time for anybody, but wow, that's a long time. And, um, And it's challenging at times because I think there's this misbelief that, you know, just because we've been together for such a long time that somehow we have worked through all those issues or problems or, you know, that we have the perfect life or whatever they people think, right? And that is simply not true. We struggle with everything that any couple would struggle with, right? And we have just tried to approach our relationship the same way we approach our sobriety, which is, I don't drink no matter what. There isn't anything that can happen in my life that drinking is going to make better. So we made a commitment in our first year together that we don't divorce no matter what, right? If we have a problem with each other, it's time to adult up and talk about it, right? Resolve it, figure it out, get through it. We're definitely the product of excellent sponsorship You know, um, our sponsors sat us down and said, okay, if you're going to do this thing, you're going to do it in the middle of AA. Any service commitment you have is also service commitment you have. We're we're making coffee together every Tuesday night. We're working on the conference committees together. We're in the musical. Well, I'm in the musical. He's making the sets for the musical because that's our wheelhouse. And, um, and we just spent a lifetime together. I don't know how it, it happened. It just happened, right? If you, uh, get up, every day and you don't drink and then you do it again the next day and then the next day time passes and you stay sober and if you wake up next to the same person day after day 
whether you're having a good day with that person or whether you're having a bad day with that person, you realize you're going to do it again the next day, time passes and you're still together. That's just the way life works, right? And so um, there's something I did want to talk about tonight that says controversy. So this is the controversial part. So I didn't want to talk about it, but it's something that we've been talking about in my fellowship at the meeting after the meeting a lot. And so I don't know if you're all talking about it in your meeting after the meetings, but um, I did want to bring it up because, you know, I've uh, really given it some thought and prayer meditation. And that's this topic of um, uh, what people are referring to as the plain language big book. So there's a new book that's coming out from GSO shortly, and we people are calling it the plain language big book, which is not the name of it. Which is important point because, you know, I know my first reaction was like, they're not going to take my big book away. I'm never going to not use the big book. And it's like, okay, that's not what this book is, right? This book is um, just another book, much like the other books we have, the 12 and 12 and and Living Sober and uh, Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers and A Comes of Age. It's a book that's meant to help people who circumstances might not allow them to understand the big book the way it was taught to some of us, right? What I try and explain, uh, I was having a conversation with a sponsee recently who was like, ah, and I was like, look at what 12 uh, prisons have you gone to to do H&I work? And they were like, what? I was like, there's 12 steps, there's 12 traditions. Tell me the 12 prisons you've been to. I can name you mine. <laughs> and he was like, well, and I was like, no, 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 well, the average reading age in 1939 when the big book came out was high school level. The average reading age in America today is uh, junior high level. In the prisons, it's elementary school level, right? And you can go to a prison and leave them the big book, right? But you might as well be leaving them something that's written in Swedish. They don't understand it, and there's nobody next to them that can explain it. The benefit that we have being on the outside. If I don't understand something, I can go to my sponsor and say, explain this to me, right? They don't have that benefit. So they do need something that's a little bit more written in a language that maybe is current and that we kind of all understand, right? Then hopefully someday, you know, they can graduate to some of that shivering denizens of mad realm, you know, stuff that we all like, oh my God. I read that and I laugh because I'm thinking, oh my God, uh, Bill Wilson was a drama queen. And, um, I love the big book. I love the big book. And I love the fact that I was given it, it was spent a f spoon fed to me. I mean, I literally had somebody explain every line to me, you know, and going to big book studies, what a great opportunity to, to learn and, um, and understand in a real meaningful way, how to apply the principles that are in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous in my life today. But not everybody has the same uh, benefits that I had. Um, and so I want them to be able to have the happy, joyous, and free that we all get to enjoy. And so whatever it takes, I'm willing to go to any lengths to help them get that. And that means if I have to use a different book before I introduce them to the bigger book, then I'm willing to do that, right? So that's all I have to say about that. Um, I came to Austin, um, Texas. Uh, because I came to um, speak at a conference and fell in love with Texas. I was like, oh my God, this who's been keeping this a secret for me my whole life? Went home, told Rob we're moving to Texas. He's like, you've lost your mind. We are never moving to Texas. He's like, we've been to Amarillo. We are not. <laughs> I'm sorry if you're from Amarillo, but that really was our introduction to Texas. And I was like, it's Austin. He's like, no, same thing. I was like, no, it's not the same thing. And so we landed in Austin and my life has become, man, just enlarged and rich in ways that I never expected it would be. I just never, ever expected it would be. It's, it's been an amazing, amazing experience. Um, I uh, got to um, participate as a member of the Ikipa Committee and that's exciting because I'm surrounded by people who are excited. And it's hard to not be excited when you're surrounded by people who are excited, right? So I've always tried to maintain a connection to the YPOF Fellowship because the truth is they are the future and hope of Alcoholics Anonymous, right? I don't mind being the token old-timer in that crowd. <laughs> I really don't. Um, 
I want them to know that if they ever feel like they're ready to graduate from the service work that they're doing in Ikipa, um, that they can come over to, you know, the Capital of Texas Conference, which is our conference in Austin that happens every year in August. And, uh, or they can work on Trudge Fest, which is happening for us in Austin on Memorial Day. It's uh, sort of a sober music festival that we have every year with uh, about four or five live bands. And we have speakers that come and we got a creek and a rope swing and we grill burgers and dogs. It's just like the best sober day ever. Right. And so, um, we do a musical every year for the Capital of Texas Conference, and I always end up writing it. And it's, I don't, it's so much fun. Like, I can't stop. You know, people are like, are you doing it again? I'm like, yeah, I know. You said last year it was gonna, you weren't doing it anymore. I was like, I know I said that, but it's too much fun. Right. And, um, and I'm having fun. And isn't that really the message that we want to carry in Alcoholics Anonymous? Why would anybody want what we have if we weren't having fun? Right. And I'm, want you to know that I'm cramming as much fun as I can cram into a lifetime, you know? Um, and uh, Renee's words were so kind, you know, in the beginning when she said what she said, and I thought about that, and it's like, you know, maybe, you know, if there is a truth to wanting to know me more, it's because I'm not, st- I'm not, not having fun. I'm still having fun, right? And, um, and that zest for living comes from being sober. And uh, if you haven't, grabbed onto that yet. Oh my gosh, please lower your defenses, <laughs> you know, stop fighting everything and everyone and get in the car, you know, do things, go places, have fun. Um, it's so wonderful to see some folks here from Austin because I know that it took a commitment to get in the car and come all this way. Right. But it's what we do for each other. Right. And I'll always remember that. Right. Um, I, uh, came to visit a couple of years ago. Um, to the Shivering Denison's meeting on Friday night, walked in, and Renee's like, what are you doing here? And I was like, I came to see you. And she's like, no, really, what are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, no, I literally thought, I haven't seen Renee in a long time. We had COVID and other things that stood in the way of us being together. And I was like, get in the damn car and drive four hours and go visit. It's not that hard, right? And uh, and I had a great time, and we went to tacos, and then we had so much fun, we did it again last night. <laughs> My life is just full in ways that I can't even express to you, right? Um, I'm so fortunate. Um, I'll wrap up with this story about um, something that was uh, very difficult for me personally. My father and I have not had a close relationship my entire life. My father was an all-star athlete and uh, he would take me out to play catch with me because especially after the teacher said that we have a problem with Solis. He's got, you know, characteristics that little boys at five years old probably shouldn't have. And so he's like, well, we're going to play more football. We're going to play more baseball. We're going to, we're going to take care of this. Right. So he would throw the ball to me and I wouldn't catch it. And he's like, you're going to learn how to catch this ball. I'm going to start throwing it at your face and you're going to put that mitt up to protect your face, you know? And I would swat at it instead and cry. And um, thankfully I had three younger brothers right behind me who were all very athletic. And I'll never forget the Sunday he told my brother Richard behind me to go get his mitt. He didn't tell me to go get my mitt. And I remember thinking, oh, shoot, I got off the hook. And then the next week, he said, Rich, go get your mitt. And I remember thinking, he's given up on me. He's ashamed of me. He's embarrassed by me. When I was only six or seven years old, and I remember thinking that it's over for me. Right? And um, my mother, who was the alcoholic, eventually got sober in AA. And um, we were on a long trip. And she said, I've got something to talk to you about. And I was like, what? She goes, it's an amends. And I was like, here we go, right? Um, Because my mother was a really bad alcoholic. Our family business was a bar. She was in the bar all the time. I was the one raising my brothers and sister because she was gone all the time. And she said, I feel like I've robbed you of a childhood. I expected you to raise your brothers and sister. She goes, and I feel like I stole your childhood from you. And I don't know how to make restitution for that. If you will tell me what I can do to make that right, I will do anything. And I remember starting to cry 
because I thought, oh my God, I can't believe we're having this conversation because I'd rehearsed this conversation in my head a hundred times, right? All the time I was growing up, someday she's going to say she's sorry and I'm going to turn to her and say, you're damn right you're sorry, right? But from the time that I'd rehearsed it to the time we were having the conversation, the healing that is Alcoholics Anonymous had taken place in its life and I've realized I've been labeling all these experiences good, bad, and ugly. They're just experiences. They're all part of my kit of spiritual tools that I get to use to help other people when they come in dragging their butt behind them saying they can't stay sober because A, B, and C. And I'm like, you left out D through Z, right? Because we have seen it all. There isn't anything you can say to us that shocks us or makes us frightened, right? And so um, when she passed away, it was really hard. Um, I was there by her bedside and she had asked that she be removed from life support if it came to that. She did not want to be artificially kept alive. So when they came in and they started unplugging the machines from her, she goes, oh, am I being moved? And I said, no, no, mom, you're not being moved. And she was like, oh. and she got that look on her face like she realized what was happening. Like, it's going down right now. Right? And she squeezed my hand and she said, I'm scared. And I said, I know. I said, but I'm right here and I'm not going anywhere and I love you. And she said, I know. And in that moment, we both exchanged and I know that I have been striving my entire sobriety to not say, right? But in that moment, I realized there are some things I need to know. I need to know you love me. I need you to know that I love you, right? Without that knowledge, what is the point of this entire journey? Think about that. We are given the keys to the kingdom. The keys to the kingdom are just this, a primary purpose, to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. How many people on this earth go from birth to death and never know what the hell this was all about? We're told up front, this is your purpose, and I get to do a quick inventory at the end of the night. Did I stay sober today? Did I help somebody stay sober today? I'm a winner. That's it. Doesn't matter what the title of my business card is, how much money I have or don't have in my account with the emblem on the hood of my card. None of that shit matters. I'm a winner, right? And so at my mother's funeral, my dad gets up and my brothers and sisters look at me like, what's he going to say? Because they'd been estranged for many years, right? So I was like, I don't know. He asked for the microphone. I gave it to him. So he said, um, all parents should love their children equally. He said, but if I had a favorite, it would be Solis. And my brothers just glared at me. I was like, I don't know what this old man's talking about. Because we have not had a relationship for 50 years. And now all of a sudden, I'm the favorite? Like, I don't know. I'm thinking he's cracked or something's happened, right? He said, um, he has overcome so much adversity in his life. Um, he said, uh, in 1967, his mother, Esther, threw me up against the wall and said, leave him alone. You're not helping. I know you're trying to make a man out of him, but he's going to grow up to be whatever kind of boy he's going to be, whatever kind of man he's going to turn into, and you are not helping. So leave him alone. I didn't know they had that argument. I didn't know they had that conversation. I thought my father was embarrassed and ashamed of me. And it turns out he was just trying to stay out of the way so I could become whoever I was going to become. See, that's it. 50 years of thinking I know. I don't know crap. And I need to be clear about that when I start thinking, I got this. <laughs> I will never got this. I will never have this, right? It's always going to be a process of learning and being willing to open my mind up to the universe and to whatever God's will is for me. And the minute I start thinking, I know I'm in trouble. I do want to wrap up because my time is up, but I will tell you before I leave, I want to thank you for all the love you've shown me here tonight. And I want you to know that when you leave here, you're loved too. Thank you. Uh -huh.